Order. Uh, questions without notice. Senator Sherry. Thank you. My question is to Senator Scullion, representing the Minister for Families, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs. Does the minister recall stating yesterday that, quote, interest rates today are at the highest they have ever been under the Howard government? And in case not everyone heard it, he repeated it a second time when he said the, that interest rates are the highest they have ever been under us. Didn't the minister also say that, quote, they are at record lows? They are indeed record lows. Given this totally confused and repeated uh, and contradictory answer from the minister yesterday, can he explain how it is possible for interest rates to be, quote, the highest they have ever been under us and, at the same time, at record lows? Senator Scullion. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, um, just, just, uh, I'm, I'm sorry that the, uh, uh, the senator opposite is confused. I'll, I'll, I'll clarify the record for him. Uh, uh, I was simply making, I was simply making a comparison, since the question given to me referred to the record, indeed a comparative analysis, which is what this place is about, and I made the point that. The very best, the very, the very best that Labor could have, could, could come up with, was 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 marginally above our very worst. Uh, Mr. President, uh, the, the the notion of the question yesterday uh, is that uh, if they, if those opposite would like to again to reiterate uh, relative benefits about the economy, and I think that's the substance of the question, Mr. President. We are we are proud, Mr. President, to Order. have. We are proud, Mr. President, to have led a government that took this country from an appalling state of affairs in 1996 when we took government, and the appalling state of affairs was reflected by an unemployment rate of 10.9 per cent at the peak of Labor, Mr. President. We now, Mr. President, and Australia now enjoys 10, a 4.3 per cent unemployment rate, Mr. President, 4.3 per cent, the lowest in 30 years. So I I'm certainly enjoy any question from the other side that seeks to genuinely compare uh, the performance in government uh, uh, over, over the years, Mr President. Uh, home mortgage rate, and that's been mentioned a number of times, and there is a concern in the Australian, uh, amongst the Australian people about what's going to happen under Labor uh, should, they, should they come to power, Mr President. And what will happen, Mr President, I think all of us know, there will be a repeat of history, Mr President. A repeat of history. You can be sure of that, Mr. President. So today we have a home mortgage rate of 8.3%, and, Mr. President, under Labor it peaked at 17%. Mr. President. So 22% for Order. business loans. I'm informed, Order. Mr. President. But, Mr. President, so for those people. Order, Senator Scullion, resume your seat. Order. Senator Scullion. Uh, so, Mr. President, uh, when we're having this, this interesting comparison about the performance of government, again, it comes down to two things. First of all, the capacity to provide an economy to provide fantastic growth in jobs, low interest rates, uh, all of those aspects that make up an economy, including inflation, uh, those are the fundamentals of a good economy. And of course, when you have those fundamentals of a good economy, you can run a government that everybody in Australia enjoys. They are enjoying the good governance of a good economy at this moment, because right today there's 2,183,000 Australians who have a job today who didn't have a job in 1996, Mr. President. And they come into this place and saying, but but what about the people who are having some difficulty with uh, with buying a home, Mr. President? And I've been to great lengths to inform the Australian people and to inform those on the other side that whilst the Australian government has done a tremendous job by giving everybody a job and ensuring that interest rates are far lower than they ever were under Labor, well, there, there is more to do. And Mr President, we have ensured that we continue to implore the states and territories, the Queensland branch of the Labor Party, the New South Wales branch of the Labor Party, the West Australian branch of the Labor Party, to do their bit as well. So instead of actually ripping off the people of those states and, and indeed of, the, of, of, uh, of, of the, the territories, what we need to do is to ensure that the relationship with the Australian people and the Labor Party in those places reflects their need to stop taxing the people. We've done the right thing. We have a fantastic economy. 
And what we need is the Labor Party to talk to their mates in the other jurisdictions to ensure that the full benefits Order, of our Senator economy Scullion, your flow time to all Australians. Expired. Your time has expired. Supplementary question, Senator Sherry. Thank you. Given the minister's interest in history, isn't he aware that uh, when Mr Howe was last treasurer, interest rates hit 22 per cent? 22 per cent, minister. And doesn't the minister's complete confusion yesterday and again today just couldn't answer the contradictory uh, questions that he, he gave, answers the questions he gave yesterday, highlight the fact that the government broke its explicit 2004 election promise that it would keep interest rates <coughs> at record lows? You've broken your promise. After nine interest rate hikes in a row, adding $457 a month to a $300,000 mortgage, how will our kids ever afford to buy their own home when you break election promise after election promise on interest rates? Order. Order. Senator Scullion. Uh, thank you, Mr President. This government, and I am very proud to be a member of a government, that has allowed people the position to have a job and to buy their own home. And I'll put beyond doubt, there is no doubt about the comparison between those opposite and ourselves, Mr President. They, they're happy to come in this place proud of the fact that they had 17 per cent, 22 per cent in terms of business loans. Those people are the ones who sent small businesses out, they sent them broke, they put people on the dole, and they, they hurt Australians, and those Australians still remember. And those Australians who don't remember, let me tell you this. You think about the comparison between interest rates, 17 per cent under Labor, 8.3 under the Coalition. Order. Senator Eggleston. Mr President, my question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Families, Community Services and Indigenous Affairs, Senator Scullion. Would the Minister advise the Senate of the latest developments in the Australian Government's intervention in the Northern Territory. Senator Scullion. Uh, uh, Mr President, I, I, I thank the Senator for his question. And I know he has a long-standing interest in, in, uh, in Indigenous affairs and certainly has been informing me on the, on the need to move the, in, the intervention in the Northern Territory, particularly his state of West Australia. I'm delighted, Mr President, uh, uh, to inform the Senate that uh, today we have announced a $740 million plan in new, involving a range of new initiatives. And this is to, be, to move beyond the stabilisation stage of the Northern Territory intervention. Now, these new measures are as follows. $540 million to repair and build housing in remote communities over the next four years. You see, Mr President, it's not good enough just to go and do the inspections and do evaluation. You need to be a government with some credible policy that moves ahead and actually does the work that it exposes. $100 million for more doctors, nurses, allied health professionals and specialist services, uh, uh, Mr President. Again, we've done over 2,000 health checks in 30 communities, as has been on the public record. That has exposed an unacceptable level of, uh, of serious health conditions, particularly in, in, in the youngest of those, of those expected. We'll be investing $100 million to move around the territory to ensure that we ameliorate those conditions. $78.2 million over three years, Mr. President, to convert the CDEP uh, positions to real jobs. And I'm delighted to say up to $30 million to be matched dollar for dollar by the Northern Territory Government. And it's rare that I would uh, normally uh, select the Northern Territory uh, Government uh, out in this, but I'm tremendous to see that they have taken a, a very sensible approach in a partnership approach. Uh, we recognise the difficulties uh, with such a, a low tax base, Mr. Mr. President, to, to take over their responsibilities in terms of CDP. So we have uh, made an offer to match them dollar for dollar to ensure that people move from an effective training position to real employment, Mr. President, to real employment. We're providing um, 18.5 million over two years for 66 additional uh, federal police, uh, Mr. President, and that, of course, is to provide continuing, uh, continue the provision of the shield of law and order that so many Australians take for granted. Now, this funding, uh, Mr. President, will be provided uh, to the Northern Territory government on the basis that they agree to certain conditions, including a radical overhaul of the way that we're going to deliver Commonwealth funds uh, to housing programs in the Northern Territory, and that they will ensure that sufficient classrooms, equipment and teachers are available to ensure that, as the welfare to reform packages 
uh, become effective uh, and that uh, clearly the uh, uh, school attendance will increase. We want to make sure that the level of amenity is there to ensure that they have uh, the same education we take for granted. Then this provides an enormous opportunity to Indigenous communities to move forward in a safe manner, Mr. President, with an economic future for those, for those areas. And it demonstrates again, Mr. Howard, uh, that, that uh, the Howard government is here for the long haul in relation to the critical issues such as uh, health, housing, and, and policing. We have a call of rubbish from the other side, Mr. President. I'll tell you what I'll tell you. If, they, if they're happy to go and engage themselves, Mr. President, what I'd call on Labor to actually enforce these initiatives, not to play this little double game of saying we support this initiative in Canberra when they're back home in Darwin, they're sort of slowly undermining. And not to follow the, the law of you know, the member for Jagger Jagger, the member for Lingiari, and a local uh, Labor member, uh, Carl Hampton, who was reported by Amanda Newen and Demu, as going out there before the intervention team and saying, when they get here, just say no. Just say no, Mr. President. So I don't appreciate interventions from, interdictions from the other side. This is an intervention that all Australians stand behind. And I'm again very proud to be part of a government who has provided so much change for our first Australians. Senator Bishop. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Coonan, representing the Minister for Foreign Affairs. Mr. President, can the Minister confirm that this week the government signed Australia <coughs> up to the US-led Global Nuclear Energy Partnership, joining the great and glorious Kakistan in this group? Hasn't the government committed Australia to joining a group that will see nuclear fuel leased to countries? then returned to fuel suppliers for reprocessing and then potentially stored in other members' countries. Isn't that why Canada, another major uranium supplier, declined the invitation to join the group? Can the minister also confirm the Federal Liberal Council in June this year overwhelmingly voted in support of establishing a nuclear waste dump in Australia to take spent fuel from other countries? Mr President, how can voters trust the government on this issue when its own party members strongly support Australia taking spent nuclear fuel from other countries to be, to be stored at a high level waste Come on, time, dump? Senator Bishop, that question was very long, Senator Bishop. Senator Order. Order. Senator Coonan. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr President, and uh, thank you. Uh, to the Senator for the question. The Global uh, Nuclear Energy uh, Partnership, of course, um, Mr. President, uh, is, a, is a US initiative which seeks to develop a worldwide consensus allowing for expanded use of nuclear energy while strengthening the nuclear non proliferation regime. And, uh, Mr., uh, Mr. President, we uh, we, in fact, welcome exp the expanded civil nuclear cooperation with the United States. And Australia has joined the United States-initiated Global Nuclear Energy Partnership at uh, a meeting, of course, in uh, Vienna on the 16th of September. And uh, we've concluded a joint nuclear energy action plan with the United States on the 3rd of September. Australia uh, supports the Global Nuclear Energy Plan goal of enabling expanded use of nuclear energy while strengthening nuclear non-proliferation. And Australia has clear interests as a major uranium producer and strong supporter of the non-proliferation regime. The uh, Global Nuclear Energy Partnership is still evolving. And, uh, Mr President, uh, I would have thought that it makes uh, eminent good sense for Australia to become involved early in the Global Nuclear Energy Partnership's development. Australia-US uh, Nuclear Energy Action Plan helps ensure that Australia stays abreast of the latest civil nuclear energy developments, and of course it includes cooperation on uh, research and development, non-proliferation, civil nuclear energy skills and technical training, and uh, regulatory issues. Uh, and it also, uh, Mr. President, provides the framework for Australia's technical involvement in the Global Nuclear Energy Partnership and uh, the Generation 4 program, 
to develop advanced nuclear reactors. Now, uh, Mr. President, uh, claims that uh, joining the Global Nuclear Energy Plan requires Australia to accept other countries spent nuclear fuel or endorse their programs, uh, or indeed um, to accept radioactive waste are in fact dead wrong. There is no such requirement. Government's policy is and will remain not to accept other countries spent nuclear fuel or nuclear waste. The policy recorded in our Nuclear Energy Action Plan. This policy, of course, is recorded in our Nuclear Energy Action Plan with uh, the United States. Um, now, uh, Mr. President, the government's policy on, in this matter is both long-standing and well-known. Australia does not accept nuclear waste from other countries, and this prohibition is enacted in law. Order. 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 Senator Bishop, uh, thank you, Mr. President. Supplementary question to the minister arising out of her response. Mr. President, can the minister confirm the government has been in discussions with companies interested in setting up an, enri an enrichment industry in Australia, which under GNEP would commit us to taking back nuclear fuel used in other countries? Didn't the director of one such company state recently that its plans would go? only ahead under a coalition government. Under GNEP, won't Australia be an ideal fuel supplier country, enriching our uranium and then taking back the spent fuel from other countries? Senator Coonan. Mr. President, well, I thought I'd uh, very explicitly answered that you question, very well. and in fact I'll repeat it. Uh, our policy of, is long-standing and well-known, and we do not accept nuclear waste from other countries. This is uh, a prohibition that is enacted in the law, and I don't think I can put it in clearer terms than that. Order. Senator Chapman. Thank you, uh, Mr. President. Uh, I also direct my question to the Minister for Communications, Information Technology and the Arts. Will the minister update the Senate on the government's nation-building broadband rollout? What is the government's response to the use of the court system and Auditor-General process by Telstra and the opposition? Senator Coonan, order. Order. Senator Coonan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And I thank uh, Senator Chapman for his question. And uh, as he is, I am concerned about Telstra and uh, the Labor Party working together to frustrate and delay the rollout of a new high-speed broadband network in Australia. While the government, of course, is focused on extending high-speed broadband out to 99 per cent of the population, it's clear, Mr President, that Labor and Telstra have been working hand in glove to try and prevent any independent broadband investment from proceeding. Now, Mr President, embarrassing Telstra documents released in the federal court in the past few days show that Telstra's and Labor's tactics included a plan to influence an investigation by the Auditor General and to commence court proceedings in the hope the rollout of the new Opal high-speed network build would be delayed. Internal Telstra strategy documents from November 2006 and June 2007 said, and I quote, the bid for funding will be non-compliant for a range of reasons. Ah. A better option than not participating may be to have the government reject our offer. Oh, and we are called. taking the view that so long as we have claims that are arguable and will not be laughed out of court, we should run them even if the prospects of success are not great. Oh. Now, Mr President, these documents also show that the Labor Party was complicit in Telstra's plans right. to derail the That's Opel right. proposal. Pride of place in Telstra's strategy to influence the Auditor-General is a letter in draft form from the Labor Party to the Auditor-General. And who was this unsigned draft letter from? None other than Senator, Senator Conroy. Conroy. Hey, got yes, thank you. And 
You have to ask, Mr. President, what was this draft letter from Labor to the Auditor General doing in a Telstra strategy manual oh, about influencing an independent oh, auditor's Stephen. review? Was it for a bit of technical tweaking, or was it to give them that notice? That's but, right. uh, Mr. President, the snag in this plan by Telstra and Labor to Stephen influence the Auditor snag. General is that the Auditor General torpedoed their arguments when he found, and I quote, it was open to government to agree to negotiations being pursued with the preferred applicant and to commit to increase the program's funding. And so, Mr. President, here we have it a Telstra plan to deliberately submit a bid that it knew was not compliant and was doomed to fail, to get the Labor Party to seek to influence the Auditor General. To try to delay the rollout order, of the new order, high order, Senator Kernan, high speed Senator Kernan, you want to Senator Conroy, you will withdraw that comment. I withdraw that she's an idiot. The, and draw unconditionally. <laughs> Senator Kernan. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I know that Senator Conroy is desperately embarrassed by being pinned here. But, uh, so Labor has tried to delay the rollout of a new competitive high-speed broadband network by Opal and then to publicly attack the government in international forums and uh, in seats all around Australia by talking up the Labor Party. Well, Telstra's disgraceful behaviour is on display for all to see, and the Labor Party's cynical, sneaky and opportunistic part in trying to delay the Opel network build has been shown for what it is. <laughs> Labor has no plan for over three million premises in rural and regional Australia that will simply miss out under its sham plan. Regional and rural Australians know you can't rely on the Labor Party. The only true friend of rural and regional Australia is the Coalition, yeah, who yeah, will continue yeah. to deliver the services yeah. they need and want. Yeah. Order. Your colleague is waiting to ask a question. Senator Hutchins. Uh, Mr. President, my uh, question is to Senator Coonan, the Minister for Communications. I refer to the letters the Minister has sent to 500,000 Australians telling them that they are not currently able to access wireless broadband. Can the Minister confirm that her letter was sent to both the Tumut and Bega telephone exchanges? <laughs> Can the Minister now explain why she sent a letter to the Bega and, tele and Tumut telephone exchanges to tell them that they have no broadband access? <laughs> Order. Isn't it the case that both of these exchanges not only have broadband access, but they actually help to provide it to the local community? <laughs> Is the minister really so desperate to sell her second-rate network that she is reduced to sending letters to telephone exchanges? How could Order. the minister be so out of touch and, frankly, incompetent? Order, order. Order. We will not proceed until there is order. Senator Coonan. Well, thank you, Mr. President. Well, what I could say about that question, of course, is that uh, it seems that Senator Hutchins has gone to the NIDA school for overacting. That's right. But uh, That's quite right. apart from that, uh, what I also can say is that uh, I'm absolute, I've been order. absolutely delighted. Order. Order. Senator Faulkner. Senator Faulkner. Senator Coonan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And of course, what this uh, really does show is how desperate the Labor Party is that information about the government's comprehensive broadband plan doesn't get out to rural and regional Australians who want these services and who won't get one under the Labor Party, right. and they certainly won't get no one in Australia will get one till 2013. So, uh, Mr. Uh, President, uh, the mail out, of course, simply informs consumers about new and affordable broadband services coming their way. Now, surely, if, uh, if the Labor Party was interested in providing Australians with access to fast, affordable broadband, it would have supported this mail out. 
I am absolutely delighted that my department wrote to over 500,000 householders across rural and regional Australia to advise them that a new wholesale broadband network is now being rolled out. And, uh, this new network will provide fast, affordable broadband to all Australians regardless of where they live. Unlike Labor, which needs an inquiry to even get out of bed, it's a wonder right. they haven't yeah. had one That's just right. to decide yeah. where they can uh, roll out uh, broadband, the Howard government is about making decisions in the best interests of all Australians and then getting on with the job of making these decisions a reality. A fast, affordable broadband uh, service for all Australians, regardless of where they live, is a reality that this government has committed to, has costed, and is currently rolling out. And uh, the Labor Party, of course, wants to shut down the good news. And uh, we all know that their response lacks credibility. It's a sham plan. It's uncosted, provides no coverage, and it only covers 75% of the country. So no wonder people in rural and regional Australia look forward to getting letters that inform them not only of the availability of services, but the fact that they will be affordable and, we, and will be available to them before 2013. Uh, it's no wonder that the Labor Party wants to stop consumers being informed. They have desperately tried to shut down the Opal network. They've conspired with Telstra to try and influence quite improperly the Auditor General. They have tried without, uh, without success to criticise every opportunity to tell consumers about services that are available regardless of, uh, of where Australians live. And it's not just uh, Labor who wants to keep consumers in the dark, of course. Telstra, who only has itself to blame, has gone on a capital strike, has failed to provide fast broadband, which it could at the flick of a switch, and then has the temerity to criticise an alternate provider who steps up to the plate and says, if Telstra won't do it, we will. <laughs> Mr uh, President, uh, I think it's, a, it's uh, an indictment on the Labor Party and an indictment on Senator Conroy, an indictment on all the people over there who he gets to ask his silly questions. Uh, the important thing is that all Australians can get fast broadband under the Coalition's plan, regardless of where they live. Order. Order. Supplementary question, Senator Hutchins. Yes, Mr President. Uh, does the minister know how many of the 500,000 recipients of her letter either already have broadband or are in fact telephone exchanges? <laughs> how much public money has been wasted on this propaganda campaign, the sole purpose of which is to help cover up the minister's incompetence? Senator Coonan. Well, uh, gee, uh, Mr. Mr. President, um, I must say I'm hardly shattered by that penetrating question. The government is strongly committed to extending high-quality, affordable broadband as far as possible across Australia. That will include a mix of technologies uh, that does include wireless, that does include ADSL 2 Plus, and uh, it will extend, of course, also the subsidy uh, for satellite uh, service and tells people about the $2 billion communications fund that the Labor Party wanted to knock off for a, res for a metropolitan That's service. Right. Uh, right. Mr uh, President, I'm very pleased that the people of Australia know that there is at least one party, and that is the government in Australia, that actually stands up for consumers, understands what they need and is getting on with delivering them, ignoring the sideshow from the Labor Party. Uh, Senator Lightfoot. Well, thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Minister for Employment and Workplace Relations, Senator Abetz. Will the Minister outline how the government has effectively balanced the role of employees, employers, and unions in Australia's workplaces? And is the Minister aware of any alternative policies? Senator Abetz. Thank you, Mr. President. Can I thank the distinguished and elegant uh, and eloquent Senator Lightfoot for his question? Mr. President, the Howard government's industrial relations laws do strike a balance. Employees are given the ability to negotiate working conditions that best suit them, underpinned by a strong safety net 
and the fairness test, which ensures conditions can't be traded without fair recompense. Employers, the people who, may I remind those opposite, actually create the jobs, are given the same ability to negotiate flexible working conditions with their workers. They have also had the job-destroying shackles of Labor's so-called unfair dismissal laws removed. And despite what Labor and the unions say, the ability of unions to represent their members in the workplace has been retained and indeed enshrined in law. But what have we done, Mr President, is to put in place a sensible law to prevent unions from simply barging into workplaces on any pretext to stand over workers and employers. Mr President, it is significant that our laws which have seen the creation now of over 400,000 new jobs, 87 per cent of which are full-time, and further real wage increases are so balanced that the Labor Party now pretends they would keep some aspects of work choices. The problem is, Mr President, Labor's position is just that, pretense. Does anybody seriously think that with 70 per cent of Labor's front bench, and 80 per cent of Labor senators for being former union officials, and might I add some of whom in their former trade union life were part of the rabble trying to break into Parliament House before our first budget, and some of those will remember and know who they are. They found it easier to get in by getting Labor Party endorsement and are now sitting in this chamber. And might I add, Mr President, would be senior ministers in a Rudd Labor government. Do you think that they would stand up to union thuggery? Of course not. And Mr President, there's the scary and very real prospect of the extremist Greens gaining the balance of power in this place and making Labor's retrograde IR policies even more extreme. And here's some of the Greens' extreme IR policies, a union wish list if ever you've seen one. An absolutely unfettered right to strike, an unfettered right for union representatives to enter the workplace, and the reinstatement, lock, stock and barrel, of Paul Keating's so-called unfair dismissal laws. No wonder, Mr President, that the unions are now pouring hundreds and thousands of dollars into green coffers. Mr President, a few weeks ago, Green Senator Rachel Seward promised that if the Greens won the balance of power, they would keep, to quote, a hand on the shoulder of a new government, particularly on the IR legislation. And today her hapless and interjecting leader of the Greens said they would harden Labor's IR position. We'll be negotiating very strongly. I predict we'll Order. improve Order. Labor's Order. position. Order. Would you resume your seat? Resume your seat. Order. Point of order, Senator Brown. Yeah, President, um, the minister heard the question. He should What's be your showing point of order? The point of order is that he's not giving us the detail about the exclusive there is preference no point exemption of order. Resume your seat. the Prime Minister on Resume work. your seat. There is no point of order. Resume your seat. Resume your seat. There is no point of order. Senator Betts. What a silly point of order from a very silly leader of the Australian Greens. But, Mr President, what we have here is that the Australian Greens will line up with the Australian Labor Party and bring into this country industrial relations laws worse than were under the Hawke-Keating regime. It will be job-destroying, it will be economy-destroying, it will be family-destroying. And so, Mr President, Order. what I urge our fellow Australians Order. to Your do time is has to expired. support the balance of the House. Order, Minister. Se Senator Stott de Spoyer. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is addressed to the minister representing the foreign minister, Senator Coonan, and I ask: Is the minister aware that on the 14th of September this year, it was the 60th anniversary of the United Nations, the first UN peacekeeping mission? Uh, I ask: Is the minister aware of reports that Australia now ranks 67th in the world in terms of commitment to troops for UN missions? Can the minister outline why the government? Uh, 
can justify or how the government can justify committing some 1,575 troops to Iraq among the approximately 160,000 troops, coalition troops there. Yet the government is not willing to commit troops to Darfur, where the uh, presence of professional, professional Australian troops could make a significant dis difference. Senator Coonan. Uh, well, thank you uh, to Senator Stott Despoia for the question. And, um, uh, no, I'm certainly not aware of the statistic that, uh, that Senator Stott Despoia has mentioned in her, uh, her question, but uh, she does in fact uh, refer specifically to uh, the situation in Darfur. And uh, I have to say that, um, of course, Australia welcomes the United Nations Security Council's establishment of uh, peacekeeping operations in Darfur, the UN African Union Peacekeeping Operations, UNAMID, uh, to take over responsibility for peacekeeping in Darfur from the African Union mission in Sudan uh, by the 31st of December 2007. And Australia has also welcomed the Security Council's authorisation for UNAMID uh, to use force to protect civilians and humanitarian workers and to support implementation of the Darfur Peace Agreement. Uh, Australia is encouraged, of course, by recent UN-AU discussions with uh, Darfuri rebel groups and by the prospect of negotiations between these groups and the government of uh, Sudan. Australia recognises, of course, that there are substantial obstacles to a settlement. Now, Australia has, and, uh, has made and will continue to make significant efforts to relieve uh, the crisis in Darfur. Uh, since mid-2004, we've provided uh, more than 71 million in humanitarian aid to Sudan and almost 11 million to address the spillover effects in neighbouring countries. Australia um, certainly has offered to provide uh, doctors and nurses to assist the UN uh, with this peacekeeping force. So, um, Senator uh, Stott Despoir, obviously aid and uh, efforts in peacekeeping can take uh, different forms. Australia considers that uh, it's very willing to step up to the plate in tragic situations such as uh, those that we've seen uh, in Darfur uh, to do our bit well and truly. And uh, uh, if there's some further information that, uh, that uh, the minister, Mr Downer, can uh, give me to add to my question, I'll most certainly uh, convey it to uh, Senator Stock Despoyer. Some supplementary questions, Senator Stott Despoyer. Thank you, Mr. President, and I thank the minister for her answer, and certainly acknowledge the uh, aid provided by our government uh, to Sudan. But I do ask the minister to get more information about why the government won't specifically commit ADF personnel, not to Sudan generally. I understand that uh, uh, that's slightly different in southern Sudan, but in Darfur specifically. Why won't Australia provide? peacekeeping troops as part of that UN mission that we have welcomed so strongly. And given our proud reputation in contributing to peacekeeping missions, uh, something like uh, 67, uh, sorry, 64 countries, 73 deployments since that first mission. But how does the minister explain the decline in under 10 years? We've gone from seventh in the world in 1999 to 67th this year. Can the minister explain that decline in contributions? Order. Senator Kernan. Uh, yes, thank you to Senator Stott de Spoyer for the, uh, for the supplementary question. And uh, I reiterate the fact that uh, Australia takes very seriously our role in relation to uh, stepping up to the plate with assistance and just to continue uh, with uh, the uh, case that I was uh, previously engaged in with Sudan. I note that we have uh, also provided, apart from our $71 million in humanitarian aid since mid-2004, almost $11 million to address the spillover effects in neighbouring countries, we have also provided 15 specialist ADF personnel to the United Nations mission in Sudan, established in March 2005, to support implementation of North-South Comprehensive Peace Agreement. We have a very proud record uh, of sending our AFP officers on peacekeeping efforts 
Uh, certainly in Cyprus, just to mention one mission, we've uh, had 40 over the past years. Uh, Mr Andy Hughes, a former AFP officer, was appointed head of a UN uh, police recently. Uh, I'll get some further information to send to Dr Spoyer, but the thrust of her question I don't think is made out. Australia steps up to the plate and takes our responsibilities where we should Order. in the those particular time situations. Yeah. Order. Time has expired. Senator McGoran. And my question is to uh, the Leader of the Government in the Senate and the Minister for Finance and Administration, Senator Minchin. Will the Minister inform the Senate of the latest report of the Australian economy from the International Monetary Fund? And what lessons can be taken from this report, Minister? And is the Minister aware of alternative uh, approaches? Senator Minchin. Thanks, Mr President. Thanks to Senator McGoran for that question. Indeed, uh, last week the International Monetary Fund, probably the, the most uh, prestigious International Economic Agency released its Article 4 report on the Australian economy. The IMF's executive board commended the Australian government on what it described as exemplary macroeconomic management, which it said was widely recognised as being at the forefront of international best practice. The report described Australia's fiscal position as very strong, noting that we'd run surpluses in nine out of the ten uh, years preceding. The IMF stated that sound fiscal, monetary and structural policies had created the conditions for a continued expansion supported by high employment. There are uh, Mr. President, several policy implications from this report. The IMS, IMF has expressed confidence that the government would continue to implement the reforms needed to spur efficiency, enhance productivity and face long-term challenges relating to uh, population ageing. Uh, secondly, the IMF has stated that, and I quote, additional revenues from the terms of trade boom have been managed prudently, a statement that Mr. President, completely ref refutes claims that uh, have been made by Labor that the government has somehow squandered the proceeds of uh, the increase in resource prices. The accompanying staff report noted that although the government's management of additional revenues from the strong terms of trade had been prudent, there would be inflationary risks if fiscal policy was loosened. It is worth quoting from paragraph 16 of the staff report, which says, and I quote, another stimulus that raises concern comes from the Australian states. The states are collectively forecasting a fiscal deficit of around half a percent of GDP in 0708. This constitutes a reversal of the surplus position that the states have been in until 0506. The states point to the need for infrastructure improvements as the main reason for the deterioration in their budgets. The catch-up in infrastructure spending comes at a time when there is already strong competition for human and capital resources from the private sector. As a result, this is putting more pressure on resources and could begin to bid up prices. So the International Monetary Fund is clearly warning about the inflationary impact brought about by state Labor governments' new borrowing. We know that state Labor governments and their business enterprises are going to increase their combined debt to no less than $80 billion by 2010 to fund projects which do risk cost blowouts, project delays and economy-wide inflationary pressures. So, Mr President, that is the risk this country faces if we end up with wall-to-wall -wall labour after this federal election. Mr President, we also know that, of course, Mr Rudd doesn't actually have an economic plan. All he has is a long list of reviews and inquiries an armada of new bureaucracies, quangos, task forces and commissions. He's promised no less than 67 new bureaucracies and 96 new reviews if he's elected. So Mr Rudd's going to promise to govern just like his state Labor counterparts, inflating the bureaucracy at a great cost to taxpayers and endlessly looking into things instead of getting on with the job of delivering outcomes for the Australian people. Uh, Mr Rudd is, of course, a career bureaucrat whose uh, only experience is implementing the ideas of others and none of his own ideas. We've seen Mr Rudd uh, have his policies dictated to him by the ACTU, the Labor Premiers, and now, of course, as Senator Abetz has said, Senator Brown is telling everyone how he's going to amend Labor's industrial Senator relations Evans. policies to make them even more union friendly. Um, they're simply filling the vacuum led by Mr Rudd's complete lack of ideas. All his ideas are to be friendly to the ACTU and raid the future fund. He has no policies to keep this economy strong and people in jobs. Order. 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 Senator Sherry. I will not call your colleague. Order. 
Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Minchin, the minister representing the Prime Minister. Can the minister confirm that since the last election, the Howard government has spent more than $800 million on advertising? Isn't this spending five times the amount the government will spend on the mental health program this year and six times as much as it will spend on rural health services? Can the minister confirm that the advertising spend includes $93 million advertising the government's extreme industrial relations changes, $27 million advertising private health insurance and $52 million on climate change spin, including $23 million worth of advertising? How much public money in total has the Howard government spent on advertising since the start of this year? And how much more will the Howard government spend on advertising before the election? Senator Minchin. Uh, Mr. President, well, these are rather tired old uh, arguments from the Labor Party about government advertising. The, uh, the Labor Party well knows that all governments of all persuasions naturally and legitimately are able to advertise government Order. programs and policies. We always get criticism from the other side if people are uninformed of government policies and programs. It is, in fact, the job of governments to inform their citizens of the policies and programs which they are implementing uh, on their behalf. And of course, the fact is, all that the Labor Party is reflecting is the fact that we are an activist, reformist government. And it is our proper role to inform the Australian people of the many exciting programs and policies that we have brought to bear during our 11 years in government. And it is our job to let them Order. know of all the good things that we're doing for them, of all the jobs we're Order. creating. Senator the, the Senate will come to order. Senator Minchin. Mr. President, as I was saying, um, they don't want to hear about the fact that it is our proper prerogative and responsibility, indeed, to let the Australian people know about all the exciting things we're doing on their behalf. And that's why they have elected us on four consecutive occasions to govern this country. And we have no shame whatsoever in ensuring that the Australian people, in ensuring that the Australian people know exactly what we are doing Order. for them and on their behalf. And how dare the Labor Party? lecture us about government advertising. Have they seen, do they go and watch the television when they go back to Adelaide and Sydney and Brisbane and see the shameless behaviour of state Labor premiers who appear in all these government advertising campaigns run by the state Labor governments? No, we don't get information when we turn on our TVs back in our capital cities. What we see is Mr Beattie or Mr Rand or Mr Brax puncing around on screen telling the people what great guys they are. It's outrageous Order. what the state Labor premiers have been Senator doing Wong. with their taxpayers' money. So we're not going to listen to any lectures from the Labor Party about government advertising. When, when the senators come to order, I will call Senator McEwen. Supplementary question. <laughs> Thank Senator you, McEwen. Mr. President. I do have a supplementary question. Is the minister aware of the Prime Minister's view in 1995 that, and I quote, in a desperate attempt to find an election life, life raft, the Prime Minister is beginning an unprecedented propaganda blitz using taxpayers' money? Can the minister confirm that the cost of the unprecedented propaganda blitz using taxpayers' money in Order the year leading right. up to the 2007 election Order. will be more than five? Hundred million dollars. Why should taxpayers have to spend half a billion dollars of their money on the Prime Minister's election life raft? Order, order on my right. Senator Minchin. Well, uh, Mr. President, I'm not sure where um, the senator gets her figures, but uh, the information to me is that for the 2006-7 financial year. Uh, total advertising placed through the central advertising system was $171 million. Um, if we look at what the state governments are doing, I always think that's quite relevant. Um, as I said, uh, in uh, the course of uh, 2006, state governments, whose total budgets are about half of what ours is, actually spent $354 million. So the state governments are not only spending twice as much as we spend, but they're only half the size. And they're not doing anything anyway. What have they got to advertise? The state governments do absolutely nothing except fail completely to supply their citizens with public transport. They can't supply them with Senator water. Wong. What do these state governments do? 
Ora! 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 Senator Carr. A senator is seeking the call. Senator Milne. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Minchin. I ask, uh, does the minister recall that when scientists were warning this time last year of extreme drought and fires for the summer, the Prime Minister said that he was sceptical about a lot of the more gloomy predictions about climate change? Does he further recall that the Prime Minister said in February of this year that the jury is still out on the relationship between climate change and drought? If so, does the Prime Minister and the government still believe in the face of ongoing drought and terrible crop failure predictions today that the jury is still out on the correlation between the intensity of drought on the one hand and the higher temperatures, higher evaporation rates and changed rainfall patterns of climate change on the other? Senator Minchin. Uh, well, Mr. President, um, we know better than most because we do represent rural Australia just how severe the drought is. Uh, we take that extremely seriously. And uh, just this week, uh, we announced an extension of exceptional circumstances relief for uh, Australians who are suffering uh, one of Australia's uh, most prolonged periods of drought. Uh, and we have ex extreme concern for the position of. Uh, farmers and other communities affected by what is a very serious drought, and I accept that there is uh, bipartisan concern for the consequences of what is clearly uh, one of Australia's uh, most severe droughts during the period of uh, European settlement in this country. Uh, but uh, the fact is that scientists have made clear that there have been periods of drought of this order uh, in previous history in Australia. Uh, this is not unique. There have been other prolonged periods of extreme drought in this country. Uh, Peter Cullen, uh, a, a significant uh, scientist who has spent much time in my home state of South Australia, um, just recently made the point that indeed Australians may have been uh, unfortunately led to believe that uh, the good seasons and the good period of the sort of 50s and 60s and 70s uh, would go on forever when much of the irrigation licences were issued in the Murray-Darling Basin on the uh, now clearly a misapprehension that uh, the good periods through that time uh, would simply continue. And as he pointed out, uh, what seems to be occurring is a return uh, to the sort of conditions which prevailed prior to those three decades of uh, exceptionally good conditions. I think it is fair to say, that, objectively speaking, uh, that from a scientific point of view, the uh, period of prolonged drought which Australia is currently experiencing has not yet been proved to be directly linked uh, to global climate change. Um, that is not to say it is not linked, uh, but I think it is proper for the Prime Minister to objectively state, based on uh, the many scientific statements to that effect, uh, that it is not yet clear that this prolonged period of drought is a direct consequence or directly linked to overall global climate change. That does, of course, not de derogate from the responsibility of state and federal governments to do their utmost uh, to deal with the reality of this drought, uh, to seek to ameliorate its um, significant effects upon uh, rural Australians uh, and those dependent on rural communities. Uh, on the other hand, it also is a fact that we take seriously Australia's role as part of the international community to do what re we responsibly and sensibly can. Uh, to deal with global climate change, and we are, and we have detailed on many occasions in this place the billions of dollars and the significant number of programs and the extent to which we are seeking to engage the international community in responsible, sensible, pragmatic, effective programs to uh, deal with and to ensure that the world can adapt to uh, the reality of global climate change. Uh, but if the question is, uh, sh is the Prime Minister right to continue to say uh, that it has not yet been proven that this period of uh, drought is directly uh, caused by or linked to global climate change, he is quite right. Order. Order. Supplementary question, Senator Milne. Thank you, Mr. President. And I thank the Minister for his uh, frankness about the ongoing climate change scepticism in the government. But I do ask the minister, and I do ask the minister, 
to apologise to rural Australians for ongoing misleading uh, those people into the view that climate change is not real or urgent and that weather patterns will return to something of the past. Does the government believe that we need to do more than just band-aid checks for drought relief, flood relief and fire relief? Does the government believe we need a new strategy for a transition in rural Australia to adapt to the realities of climate change? Senator Minchin. Uh, well, Mr. President, I think, um, with respect, Senator Milne has completely misrepresented the government's position on this. Um, she asked me a question about the uh, assertions of a link between this drought and global climate change, which uh, it is asserted is anthropogenic. And, and I was answering that question. The question was not about the issue of climate change per se, and I have detailed to her the extent to which we are taking seriously our responsibilities as <laughs> members of the international community to address uh, the reality of climate change. Um, of course the climate is changing, and of course this country has the least reliable climate in the world. We have known that from the outset of European settlement, that this is the driest inhabited continent on the planet, uh, and I live in the driest state in this uh, continent, and it has the least reliable climate. And it is right to say that we must all, in our farming practices, ensure that we continue to live with that reality. Senator McLucas. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to Senator Scullion, the Minister representing the Minister for Families, Community Services and, in and Indigenous Affairs. Does the Minister recall Minister Brough's promise on 25 July that bilateral agreements with Western Australia, the Northern Territory and the ACT under the Commonwealth State and Territory Disability Agreement would be completed very soon after that meeting? Given it is now two months since Mr Brough made that promise, can the Minister explain why no agreements have been signed? Can the Minister confirm that none of these three jurisdictions has, has even received a written offer from the Commonwealth? When does, the, when does Mr Brough intend to deliver on his promise to complete bilateral agreements under the CSTDA? And how much longer will Australians with disabilities have to wait for Mr Brough to get his act together? Senator Scullion. Uh, uh, perhaps I can take the, the last aspect of uh, that question first, uh, uh, Mr. President. I, I think it is, is quite misleading to this place to say that uh, Minister Brough has uh, somehow not provided for Australians in regard to disability. Uh, this, this is a minister who has, because of the failure of the Labor states, had to provide the $1.8 billion package outside of that arrangement to ensure that Australians with a disability get a fair go. Get a fair go, uh, uh, Mr. President. Uh, in, re in regard to the to the three offers, uh, uh, Senator, uh, through you, uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, the offer was made on the basis that we, if the states and territories come up with a submission to identify, so each of the states and territories then identify the particular amounts that they they're, they're going to have, then the, uh, and 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 uh, and Mr. President, um, I understand that that is the case. No, no, no. They have been uh, at certain times. The minute it interjects with July, uh, uh, I'm sorry to have a conversation without going through, you, Mr. President. But, but um, at different times, those particular states uh, and and territory, that particular state and territories have responded. Mm. I, I, I understand that is under active consideration. They responded at different times under active consideration, Mr. Mr. Uh, uh, Mr. President. And I, I, underst I understand that that those negotiations are of a most amicable nature uh, and are done in, a, in the expression of a partnership. Now, I do understand also, uh, uh, Mr President, uh, that uh, Queensland wasn't amongst those, Mr President. Uh, the Queensland government wasn't one amongst those. When we've had an offer, uh, we've had an offer that uh, should anybody identify unmet need in areas of respite and supported accommodation, the two most fundamental areas in the areas of disability, of course, there was no offer from Queensland. There was stark silence, uh, oh, uh, Mr. President, uh, and that's why this government moved to, uh, to to have a partnership with those states and territories who were fair income about this. And I have to commend West Australia, who has a long, uh, a, a long, uh, uh, a long history of of, uh, of setting the pace in terms of disability. The Northern Territory and the Australian Capital Territory, and I think they've been they've done very well in that matter. In terms of the uh, the CSTDA. Uh, 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 Mr. President, I, I mentioned that uh, uh, there, were, there were a number of issues that we had to deal with outside of the CSTDA. 
Part of the CSTDA, uh, we have a requirement in the, in the existing CSTDA that the states and territories provide us with, with, with an evidentiary process about where is the unmet need. We're a government that just doesn't throw money around. We want it prioritised. And we know there is unmet need and supported accommodation and respite. And so when we said to the, to, to the states and territories, can you provide us with that over time, it simply hasn't been provided. And so on the, with the support of industry, we have said, well, we'll certainly go out and do it ourselves. So we have, in terms of helping older carers and their children, provided uh, $962 million. In terms of supporting accommodation, that's $562 million. And Mr President, we are rolling that out at the moment. I announced uh, about three weeks ago I was in Townsville, the first start of the consultation processes. So the money goes where the need is most, Mr President. We then helping families with disabilities and their families is $744.8 million. Child disability assistance is $721.2 million. Children's services is 23.6. Mr. President, I could go on and on, but this 1.8 billion is above and beyond the Commonwealth State Disability Agreements because this government is about a government who leads. We wouldn't be able to make this investment without a fantastic economy, and we wouldn't be able to make this investment, Mr. President, if we had weak leadership. We're not prepared to muck about. Labor is weak on leadership, Mr. President. John, the Howard government is strong on leadership, and we have made a decision. We are going to help all those people in need of disability, Mr. President. Order. Time has expired. Order. Order. Supplementary question, Senator McLucas. Thank you, Mr. President. I note that the minister could not explain why no agreements have been signed some two months after uh, the minister indicated that it would be very soon that these agreements would be reached. Can the minister confirm that Minister Brough is in fact raiding the disability assistant pack? assistance package announced in June in order to fund the bilateral agreements. Is, if the funding for the bilateral agreements is coming from the disability assistance package, does this mean that non-government providers from Western Australia, the Northern Territory and the ACT will be frozen out, out, frozen out of any additional funding to support older carers of people with disabilities? Senator Scullion. Uh, I reiter reiterate, uh, uh, Mr. President, uh, as part of my initial answer, was quite clear. In, in terms of the three agreements, this is this is a partnership approach, uh, and the, it is an amicable agreement. And announcements in, in terms of that partnership approach will be made shortly. In terms of uh, the so-called raiding of the of, of of the extra funds that the Commonwealth put in, the 1.8 billion dollars that we put in, this is a the $1.8 billion is in fact not directly going to be spent on the ter state and territory governments. Quite the contrary. We are engaging with all the NGOs and all the service providers across the, the disability community, community to ensure that those dollars are spent in the very best way. And, uh, and frankly, Mr. President, this is a frustration because of the inability of the Labor governments to be able to provide for this. Again, the simple message is this, Mr. President, we need strong leadership, which the Howard government gives instead of the weak leadership that is provided by the Labor government. I ask further questions be placed on the notice paper. Senator Coonan. Thank you, Mr President. Um, I just wish to add to um, an answer that I gave earlier to uh, Senator Scott Despoia concerning the United Nations Association of Australia first annual report card on the Australian government's performance at the United Nations. And, uh, Mr President, I wish to inform the Senate that we are the 13th largest financial contributor to the United Nations and contribute $100, um, $100 million to the United Nations annual peacekeeping budget. That's US dollars. In 0708, Australia will deliver an estimated $3.2 billion in official development assistance, 20 per cent of this through multilateral funds, including 10 per cent through UN agencies and programs. We are, of course, an active and respected participant across a wide range of core UN functions, and we're strongly committed to the ongoing reform efforts. And just also to add, uh, Mr. President, that uh, in relation to Australia's commitment in Cyprus over 40 years, I'm uh, informed that the Australian Federal Police have served in Cyprus with distinction, and the number of officers serving there have exceeded at least, or are at least, 1,100. Senator Ellison. Uh, Mr. President, uh, yesterday Senator Ellison asked me a question without notice. In relation to a report of the United Kingdom, uh, study of the impact of the British nuclear tests carried out in Australia. 
Uh, that report has yet to be presented to a parliamentary committee, but nonetheless I have obtained further information on that, and I table uh, that further information and seek leave to have it incorporated. Is leave granted? There being no objection, leave is granted. Now, are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Carr. Yes, um, Mr Deputy President, I move to take note of all government uh, answers, to, uh, and in particular to those to Senator Minchin regarding government advertising. Today, Mr Deputy President, we were told by Senator Minchin that he has no shame. He has no shame when it comes to the question of the wanton waste of public monies when regard to government advertising. We now have a situation in the run-up to this election where $500 million will be spent by this government in a desperate attempt to secure a life raft in the, in the face of what is becoming increasing levels of public dissatisfaction with the, this government. A situation where we've got now some $2 billion has been spent on public advertising since this government came to office. This is a desperate attempt by this government to avoid public accountability. This is a government that is seeking to pump out hundreds of hundreds of millions of propaganda to hide from the public and of course in a period when they should have called an election. We all understand this is one of the longest running parliaments in the history of this Commonwealth. This is a government that has desperately running from the Australian people. This is a government that has sought to abuse public advertising in such a manner which goes to the heart of the nature of the deceit and, and the contempt, the deception that this government shows to the Australian people. We of course saw in the last year's uh, annual report of the Prime Minister's Department where they even avoided reporting on government advertising. And a whole series of sums, including $209 million for the year 0506, were neglected from being reported. And of course, this year's figures will not be reported until well after this election. It's $500 million that this government is spending in the run-up to this election. We now have a situation where this government's deceit, its dishonesty, has been visited upon its own ranks. We know, as the situation arose some years ago, when Shane Stone pointed out to us that this is a government that has a reputation for being mean and tricky. We now have a situation where this government has been in a period of total turmoil as it has visited upon its own ranks this deceit and deception. We have a situation where Mr Costello, we are now told, will take over from this Prime Minister at some point in the future, on the condition, of course, that the Liberal Party agrees. Now, this, of course, is now about the fifth time that promises have been issued by Mr Costello by Mr Howard. And of course, going back to 1994, Mr Costello was told that uh, the Prime Minister would serve only two terms and then hand over. Mr Ian Macdonald, of course, was a witness to those discussions and kept a note in his, in his wallet for 13 years. He kept the note. He kept the faith for 13 years, the poor, hapless fool that should be able to provide advice about this Prime Minister's capacity to tell the truth. We have a situation back in 2003. Uh, order. S Senator Macdonald. I've been uh, misrepresented. I didn't keep a note of anything. Uh, and Senator Carr seems to have confused me with someone else. On the point of order, Senator Carr. No, but it's... No, there's no point of order, Senator Macdonald. Uh, Senator, Senator Carr. Three, Mr Deputy President, of course we had the Athens Declaration, where the Prime Minister yet again reneged on a promise to Mr Costello, where he said, of course, that he would uh, hand over when he was 60, 64. We now discover what a deception that was. We now, of course, being told that there was uh, further promises made and that Mr Costello would be the first to be consulted about the future uh, of the, the Prime Minister's plans. We discover, just in the last fortnight, he was the last to be consulted about the Prime Minister's plans. Of course, we all understand who was the first, and that was Mrs Howard. We all understand who made the decision. It wasn't the Liberal Party. It was Mrs Howard. We all now understand that the, the, the uh, Deputy uh, Leader of the Liberal Party was deceived yet again. And now we are told, of course, that sometime in the future, some indeterminate date, if the Liberal Party agrees and if the Prime Minister hasn't already organised another candidate, then maybe Mr Costello will get an opportunity to serve. 
Well, of course, we have a situation where this follows a whole series of pattern, a pattern of deceit by this government. We see it on foreign debt, where we were told, of course, a promise that was given. I promise you, said the Prime Minister in 2005, we will follow policies which will bring down foreign debt. What has produced the exact opposite? We were told no worker would be better, would be worse off in, in, in January 1996. And of course, how ridiculous that proposition now looks. We were told on interest rates, who do you trust to keep interest rates low? As the Prime Minister said in the 2004. We were told on Iraq. I can definitely say we won't be uh, uh, adding hundreds of millions. Of course, we went to war on a lie. This is a government that has been founded Senator on Senator Kay, one your lie time has another. expired. S Senator Joyce. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy President. Um, it's interesting hearing Senator Carr talk about deceit and deception and things that happened in the past. Um, one could draw to attention what's happened in the past, possibly in Queensland, where on the 5th of March 1990, um, documents pertaining to uh, a rape at a correctional centre were shredded uh, with other matters. That is uh, the ultimate deceit and deception when people um, decide to party themselves to actions like that. Uh, but, however, moving on to other things, uh, the inter in all answers, interest rates in this government show an incredible record of good management. Interest rates in this government show that one of the, the greatest records of closeness to other benchmarks in the world, especially the US benchmark. It's interesting today to note that uh, our official interest rate is at 6.5 per cent. The interest rate in the United States is at 5.25 per cent. There's only, there's only between those two one and a quarter per cent. Um, that is a management figure. That is a management figure. That is the capacity of the government to manage. What we can note, however, is that when the Labor Party were in power, uh, the US interest rates and the differential between our US rates and the US rates was around about 8.3 per cent. That also is another management figure. That is a management figure that shows that in, they were in excess of about seven times the differential of what we've got now. And that comes straight down to the capacity to manage a domestic economy. Now, one of the fundamental aspects of a domestic economy is having people with the expertise to manage that economy. See, what we have, and I've said this before, we are, we're on a, a political 747 here, and it's the capacity of how it's going to fly is determined by the people who are in the cockpit. Now, the Labor Party, we have left the door open on their cockpit, and we're having a look inside. And the question has to be asked, has any of them ever flown a political 747 before? And the answer, obviously, is no. In fact, none of them have ever flown before. I don't think there is one person on the Labor front bench who has ever managed a business. Not one. Not one have they gone out and sourced a person with the capacity that would be required to run the economy. They haven't even gone close. If you want conceit and deception, is the conceit and deception to be um, completely errant in getting onto your front bench those with management expertise in business? It's quite obvious that you're not going to be able to uh, have any um, credentials in running a trillion-dollar economy uh, when there's no one that's run so much as a corner store. Uh, what are they relying on? Divine providence to find these people. That the, the skills in, in managing an economy will sort of descend upon them. And then to hear, this, um, to hear that their espousal towards uh, management expertise, well, I suppose all you'd have to look at is the states. The states are the best reflection on what Labor Party management's like. And our, my state, Queensland, is probably one of the best ones. At the moment, there are, I think, about $16.4 billion in, in the government in debt. That's what they've chalked up on the state's credit card, and they're moving, they're moving towards, I think, approximately now between 40 and 50 billion dollars in debt. Now, the person who was responsible for that, the treasurer of Queensland, or who was at the time the treasurer, what have they done to her? Someone who has been so uh, completely devoid of any any management expertise. What do they? What prize do they present her? She is now the premier. She is now the premier of Queensland. But I would counsel 
Senator Carr very strongly when he talks about deceit and deception and all those things that are involved in it and things that have happened in the past and things that should be addressed and the truth that should be tabled because there's some truths that have never been tabled and I hope someday they might be tabled in here because there are a lot of answers that are required and maybe this government only has another four or five days to go, maybe, but it would be an absolute, another travesty of justice if those people who, are involved in the, who have been suffering for so long from so many acts have to once again put aside any hope of those acts ever being dealt with. Senator Hutchins. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy President. Um, I wish to take note of uh, the answers given today by Senator Minchin, but before I do that, I, I detect, uh, as maybe you do yourself, Mr Deputy President, in the comments that are being made about the backgrounds of Labor Party minister, or shadow ministers and members of parliament, that there's some sort of uh, inverted snobbery about what our backgrounds might be. It almost appears, from what Senator Joyce just said, that we should be born to rule and that they are born to rule and they are better at it and we should just get on with it and go back to serfdom where our forebears came from. I just remind you, Mr Deputy President, that even the House of Lords now has been reformed. Even the House of Lords, Senator Joyce, is elected. Mr. Acting Deputy, or Mr. Deputy President, <coughs> Senator Minchin gave a pretty hysterical response to questions in relation to government advertising. And I suppose that reflects really the degree of desperation that the government is experiencing at the moment, particularly with its senior levels of management. Because I've always, and I've expressed this before, I've always had uh, a lot of time for the integrity of Senator Minchin. But today, I thought he was quite shameless in his uh, hysterical, uh, un unfounded attack on the uh, state Labor governments, but indeed trying to defend the position that uh, is clearly indefensible. I'm assuming that uh, Senator Minchin was a member of the Shadow Cabinet uh, before 1996. And unfortunately, I was going to play the uh, who said this game that Senator Abetz does, but Senator McEwen mentioned it in her question to the minister. Let me just quote from a press release on the 5th of September, almost now 12 years ago, by then Leader of the Opposition, John Howard. Let me just pull out from that press release, Mr Deputy President, some quotes. Of course, Senator McEwen has already mentioned this first bit, but I'll go again with it. Let me start with this. In a desperate attempt to find an election life raft, the Prime Minister is beginning an unprecedented propaganda blitz using taxpayers' money. Now, I've already alerted to you, Mr Deputy President, that that was, in fact, John Howard said that. He further went on to say this. They don't want their money. Well, this is taxpayers. They don't want their money wasted on glossy advertising designed to make the prime minister feel good. He went further. He said there is clearly a massive difference between necessary government information for the community and blatant electoral government propaganda. And finally, Mr. Act Mr. Deputy President, he said this. The problem for this government is not communication. The problem is that it is tired. It has broken too many promises. It has hurt too many people. This propaganda blitz will make the electorate feel even more angry. Now, aren't those prophetic words, Mr Deputy President? They could well be the, last, the dying words of the government that uh, we are preside is presiding over Canberra at this moment. We could well mention that, as it has been highlighted by Senator Carr, that almost since this government has been in power, nearly $1.5 billion has been spent on an election on, on advertising blitz. It appears that in the next uh, period it's up to $500 million is going to be spent on advertising. 
Let me make this point, Mr Deputy President, because I know my time is going to uh, expire shortly. If we applied the money that has been used for blatant electoral propaganda by the government, we could have paid for 28,000 secondary school teachers. We could have paid for 32,000 nurses. We could have taken steps to fix the skills shortage. Yet, all we've seen, and just two examples, Mr. Acting, Mr. Deputy President, we saw that shameless advertising on the GST that unchained my heart, and even uh, now they're planning a climate change uh, advertising blitz for a group of people Senator Hutchins, that don't believe in Your time has it. expired. Senator McGoran. Uh, Mr. Deputy President, there's something very phony about the Labor Party this, this week. Uh, even previous, but especially this week, as we most likely have the last week of the parliament but before an election, is something very phony, and it came out in the last two speakers, because uh, two days into this week, they have feigned a concern, a connection, they say, with the households of Australia in regard to housing affordability and the pressures households are feeling with uh, increased prices in the area of groceries, etc. Now, they have not, on a Tuesday afternoon, in what is a most valuable debating period on air, been able to sustain that debate. They have gone right off the economics and back to what they know best, and that is personal abuse, an attack, a personal attack on the leader of, uh, of the Senate and, no less, the Prime Minister, led by Senator Carr. Now, if you're going to allow Senator Carr to lead you, uh, question, uh, take note of questions, then you're not serious about the economic debate. And if there was one message given to the Labor Party at the last election in 2004, which they ought to carry into this coming election, that is establish your economic credentials. Well, they are so phony they can't even sustain the economic debate for two days, which we will always welcome. They are so phony, the Labor Party, in calling themselves economic conservatives now, when we know Throughout the past decade of this government, there was not a reform that brought the economy to its sound state it is today, not a reform that the Labor Party did not, uh, did not reject. And now they wish the Australian people to accept them as economic conservatives. It was not so long ago that the Leader of the Opposition, Mr Rudd, declared himself a democratic socialist and said there ought to be a red line through every policy of government. Red line through every policy of government. There's something phony about a leader who says that no less than eight months ago and now is wanting to be called an economic conservative. There's something phony about an opposition here in the Senate that can not sustain an economic debate for two days. Feign, uh, feign a concern for the, uh, uh, the mortgage payments of the households but we will not get up in this chamber and debate it on air. There is something very phony about an opposition who will not recognise the fundamentals of this economy, which they say they would support its government's policies. They, they, they will not, not accept the fundamentals of this economy are in good, sound order. And, our, and the leader of the uh, uh, government uh, quoted the I IMF in declaring Australia's economy as sound and one of the best in the world because of the hard decisions made to bring about that, those reforms. Hear, hear. There's something very phony about the a Labor Party that, that, uh, that, that itself presided, when in government, over 17 per cent interest rates in housing mortgages, 24 per cent in small businesses, presided over a million unemployed. $96 billion of debt and so on. You know the story. There's something phony about a Labor Party when in government, instituted those policies and now want to be called economic conservatives. And as I say, that's what they did in government. If you want to know what they did in opposition, they voted against every single reform this government introduced Shame. so as to bring about the sound economy that is now being praised by the International Monetary Fund. And as I say, there's something phony about uh, the Labor Party when their leader tells us he's a socialist democrat not some eight months ago and now he wants us to believe he, he's a, 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 an economic conservative. And there's something even more phony when you 
make the potentially the Minister for Industry, Mr Kim Carr, who runs on trust. That was his debate today. Trust in the Prime Minister. His own side don't trust him. And you know it yourself. And, and to, to, to think that he is the potential Minister for Industry must send a shiver up industry's spine. I can't believe if by chance you're elected, you'll ever make him minister for anything. It's a disgrace you've got him on, on the front line. There's something phony about Senator Carr being uh, the minister for industry, and you know it yourself. It's as laughable as Rasputin in the, uh, and his credibility in the Tsar's court. There's something very phony about the other side. When there's something very phony about the other side when they say they're not run by the unions, yet 70% of the front bench is made up of unions. Senator McGoran, your time has expired. Senator Kirk. Thank you, Mr Deputy President. I rise to take note of answers uh, given today um, to questions asked by the opposition, um, particularly those asked of um, Leader of the Government, Senator Minchin. Mr Deputy President, the Howard government has wasted almost $2 billion on government advertising since it came to power in 1996. In fact, since the last election, it has spent more than $800 million on government advertising. In fact, $126 million of um, advertising was uh, spent just in the last financial year. We've heard today, Mr Deputy President, from uh, other speakers that the estimated cost of this government's propaganda blitz using taxpayers' money in this election year, 2007, is estimated to be more than $500 million. That is half a billion dollars, Mr Deputy President. Meanwhile, of course, Australian working families continue to struggle not only with interest rate, rate hikes but also the increasing price of food and petrol. This demonstrates just how completely out of touch the Howard government has become with the plight of Australian working families. It also shows the government's arrogance, which appears to view taxpayers' money as its own to spend however it sees fit. In the short time I have available, Mr Deputy President, I'd like to take the Senate through a few examples of the government's expenditure on advertising campaigns in key policy areas, beginning first with the government's extreme IR laws. This government has spent $93 million advertising its extreme IR laws. The Howard government's changes to work choices have been Another, a further extravagant excuse to spend more of taxpayers' money on advertising these unfair laws in an election year in the lead-up to the poll later, later on this year. These laws, as we know, have shown themselves to be exactly what the Labor Party said they would be, that is, unpopular, extreme and unfair, and they have hit working families very, very hard. No amount of taxpayer-funded advertising will change the substance of these laws, Mr Deputy President, yet this doesn't stop the Howard government trying to fool the Australian public with its taxpayer-funded advertising. $20.5 million alone was spent on the campaign to, prom to promote the Office of Workplace Services and the Office of the Employment Advocate. A further $40 million was spent on promoting the Employee Advisory Program, a program designed to encourage employers to promote work choices. Mr Deputy President, when Australians see these ads on TV, they should shudder at the expense because every tax dollar that the government uh, spends on advertising is one less dollar that can be um, spent by, by Australian families on clothing, children's education, groceries and other essentials of life. Moving now to climate change, the government has recently launched a $52 million campaign on climate change, including $23 million in advertising. The campaign includes an expensive series of television advertisements and a booklet to be mailed to every household in this nation. The government has consistently, as we know, overpromised and underdelivered when it comes to climate change. Since 1996, the Howard government has failed to deliver on almost $460 million of funding it promised to climate change initiatives. 
As a consequence, Mr Deputy President, less than 0.05 of percent of the $245 billion federal budget is being spent on climate change initiatives. Mr Deputy President, 0.05 is a blood alcohol limit, not a climate change strategy. I could go on, Mr Deputy President, uh, to talk about the money that's been spent on superannuation advertising—$69 million. Private health insurance. The government spent $27 million on advertising private health insurance. It spent $6 million on advertising regional telecommunications, and $20 million has been spent on advertising government internet policies. Mr Deputy President, a Labor government, a Rudd Labor government, will end the abuse of taxpayer-funded government advertising. A Rudd Labor government will cut spending on government advertising and ensure that all advertising campaigns costing more than $250,000 will be time has expired, authorized. Senator Kirk. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Carr be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. Senator Stott to Spoyer. Deputy President, I wish to take note of the answer provided uh, to me today from Minister Coonan, representing the Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, in relation to my question on Sudan and uh, the issue of peacekeeping uh, for forces. Uh, Mr Deputy President, I know that, especially with an election looming, we're all very focused, understandably, on key uh, and pressing domestic issues. But I just wanted to raise the issue of peacekeeping in this place, especially when we're dealing with is not a looming international crisis, but is uh, an international crisis in uh, Darfur in Sudan. We commemorated in this uh, nation last week, September 14th, uh, the anniversary of um, the first UN peacekeeping mission, the 60th anniversary it was last week. And indeed, uh, Australia has a proud history in peacekeeping missions. Uh, four Australians were the first personnel of a multinational force deployed to Indonesia to monitor a ceasefire between the Dutch colonialists and Indonesian republicans uh, so those 60 years ago. And since then, I'm proud to see that our country has uh, uh, provided huge contributions in, to peacekeeping missions—73 missions we've participated in in 64 countries. Uh, I note today, Mr Deputy President, there was an interjection from at least one senator. Remember East Timor? Of course, the Democrats are more than most remember East Timor because of our long and proud uh, support for uh, East Timorese independence over a long period of time. But we commended not only the government role, but the role of our troops in that particular peacekeeping force. But that was 1999, when Australia was ranked seventh, seventh in the world in terms of our contribution to peacekeeping missions. Where are we now, Mr Deputy President? Well, as of last weekend, reports suggest 67th. Our world ranking is 67th. Now, that's completely inappropriate uh, for a nation um, like ours, a nation that is committed to a number of conflicts, a number of theatres of war at the moment. And I use the figures in my question to the minister today, the fact that we have 1,575 uh, personnel uh, deployed to uh, Iraq. Obviously, that's, uh, uh, that's the, uh, the big, biggest single deployment that Australia has in terms of a theatre at the moment. Um, where that number is part of 160,000 coalition troops. Now, I'm not suggesting, Mr Deputy President, that we can't or aren't making a difference there, but think of the difference. A comparable or even a few troops or personnel, uh, a sum of that number being deployed to a UN peacekeeping mission such as that in Sudan, what significance that would have. So, Mr Deputy President, I would like the government to answer more specifically, and I note that the minister came back with additional comments today, but why have we declined? Why is our world ranking so comparatively bad, given our proud history, given the resources we currently have? And I acknowledge the ADF deployment uh, around 15, troop, uh, uh, 15 personnel in southern Sudan, but please remember, colleagues, that this is a different conflict. There may be some overlap, but this is a different conflict uh, in relation to um, uh, uh, Operation Azure that uh, is, is currently deployed in Sudan. I'm talking about Darfur, where we know, we know that there is a crisis that is unfolding. We know that we should be playing a bigger part. We have anything from 200,000 to more than 400,000 people died, 2.5 million people displaced. 
I'm not sure, Mr. Deputy President, if colleagues are recently aware of, of well, the most recent fighting, uh, despite negotiations between warring parties. Um, but even uh, in the last couple of days, the last couple of weeks, certainly September 10, uh, September 11, uh, resulted in a number of civilian deaths as well. Recent attacks by helicopter gunships, um, of course, uh, Sudanese government, uh, and ground forces. These resulted in many civilian deaths. And I'm not sure, Mr Deputy President, if our country is aware of its obligations. We've all said not another Rwanda, not another Rwanda, but this is the situation that is happening in Darfur. And I plea, I urge this government, in the midst of all this electioneering, please spare a thought for what is going on in Darfur. We have a proud history of peacekeeping, Mr Deputy President. I want to hear from this government why we aren't heeding calls to support what is a UN-backed mission as opposed to Iraq, which, let's remember, was not. Why are we declining in terms of our peacekeeping contributions? And secondly, why specifically are we not involved in Darfur? Because we shouldn't have that blood on our hands as a nation. I hope that we do not. I don't want to see another Rwanda, and I urge all colleagues uh, to find out what on earth is going on with our government's deployment strategy in this regard. The question is that the motion moved by Senator Stott to Spoyer be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Against say no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it.